So you can make the PPT in full screen and in another one minute, we'll be going live. Okay, I just wanted to add one picture which I've downloaded. Anyways, I'll just do it. If you want to add, you can add it, sir. Not a problem. Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, doing that only. Okay, okay. Just give me a minute. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, all set. All right, sir. So we are good to start. Yeah. With all your due permission, we are beginning with the session. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to all the viewers who are present here with us today. I am Batul from IGCP, and I would like to welcome all the viewers who have joined our platform for the better exchange of knowledge that is going to be shared by our keynote speaker, doctor, for today's session. He is none other than Professor Dr. Nishant Kumar, sir. So needs no introduction, but it's my pleasure and honor to introduce a very renowned anesthesiologist at our platform for such a beautiful experience that he's going to share with us. So is MBBS, DA, DNB, MNAMS, Professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at Lady Harding Medical College and Associated Hospitals. With the help of Sir, we'll be taking a close look on today's topic, which is total intravenous anesthesia and target controlled infusion. With the help of sir, we'll be taking a close look about the topic, but before moving on to today's session, let us have a brief look on what the topic says. TIVA procedures are required when administering general anesthesia to a kid who is susceptible to malignant hypothermia or scoliosis. On the other hand, the foundation of TCI systems is the idea that a syringe driver may be created using software that includes mathematical formulation. Now, without any further delay, I would like to welcome Sir at our platform so that with his wonderful insights, Sir can brief us more about the topic. Sir, over to you. Please proceed. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope I'm audible. And uh, thank you for a lovely introduction to the topic. Now, uh, at the outset, I'll say that I'll have no uh, financial disclosures, no conflict of interest. And any products that you see in my PPT, I've got absolutely no bias. And I don't promote any of these brands or any of the uh, pharmaceutical companies that you may come across with my presentation. Now, the objectives of uh, today's presentation would be, what is total intravenous anesthesia? That is TIVA. Principles of TIVA, drugs used, TCI, target control infusion principles, combinations of drugs, different ways of TIVA, how I do it, opioid-free TIVA, Troubleshooting diva and what are the what do the guidelines say about practice of total intravenous and target control infusion anesthesia? Now, what is TIVA or what is total intravenous anesthesia? It is simply a technique of general anesthesia or sedation or analgesia which utilizes only intravenous agents, including muscle relaxants. Now, there's a common misconception that TIVA means that you're not going to use muscle relaxants. Now, let's come back to the definition of anesthesia. Anesthesia consists of three A's, that is eryflexia, amnesia, and analgesia. Muscle relaxant is not a part of anesthesia per se, it is eryflexia. Usually, muscle relaxants are used for eryflexia, but yes, they may or may not be used with TIVA technique with or without regional anal uh, analgesia or anesthesia. Now, spinal, epidural, any regional blocks are not contraindicated. It's just that TIVA means that we'll be using solely intravenous anesthetics to maintain the depth of anesthesia and analgesia without any inhalational agents, even nitrous oxide. Now, inhalational agents means uh, oxygen obviously we'll be using and air we'll be using as a diluent but we won't be using nitrous oxide and none of the um, fluorinated, uh, iodinated ethers. That is, our uh, fluorines, we won't be, halothane, iso, sevo, we won't be using our 
volatile anesthetic gases. So that is what is TIVA. Now, coming to that, we all have practiced TIVA one way or the other. How many have you given ketamine to a child who's uh, you know, gone for a CT scan or uh, given midazolam or a combination of propofol and ketamine for um, family planning cases? To all the viewers, so we'll be joining in sometime. He's facing some technical glitch. So, so we'll be here in some time. Please stay tuned with us. Um, I'm extremely sorry. I got disconnected. Hope I'm audible. But yes, I'm sir, audible. you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, Please continue. There was, I think, a power outage, so I got uh, disconnected. I'm extremely sorry for that. So, uh, basically, yes. Uh, so, there's a superior recovery profile, early discharge. Uh, no need to emphasize on the green anesthesia. We know that the inhalational agents, they uh, persist in the atmosphere for a long period of time, death fluorine and nitrous oxide are uh, uh, particularly uh, vulnerable, uh, I mean, uh, notorious for that. And in fact, these are all ozone layer depleters. As uh, Batula said in her introduction, no risk of malignant hyperthermia, very less, uh, less risk of uh, postoperative nausea vomiting, which is the most common cause of uh, overstay and uh, return to the hospital after surgery. In thoracic surgeries, it preserves uh, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, improves the VQ mismatch, decreases the stress response, and in neurosurgeries, it preserves cerebral autoregulation and CMR O2. Now it is time that we ditch the inhalational anesthetics and move on to TIVA. So, what is the principle of TIVA? Now, IPL season is going on. I think there's some problem with my connection. I'll just uh, sort it out. Extremely yeah. sorry for that. Yeah. So uh, we gave a bolus dose to fill the central compartment. There's a constant rate infusion to replace the drug loss by elimination. And then there's a transfer between the compartments. So we have a three compartment model. I'll be coming to it uh, later. So there's an exponentially decreasing rate to replace the drug loss to the tissues and because of transfer or distribution. So the principle is bit, bolus, elimination, and transfer. Now, another principle that is employed for uh, total intravenous anesthesia and TCI is context sensitive half life. 
तो कॉन्टेक्ट सेंसिव हाफ लाइफ इज बेसिकली टाइम इन विच द प्लाज्मा कंसेंट्रेशन इट इज अ प्लाज्मा कंसेंट्रेशन decreases to 50% after stopping the infusion so the drugs obviously with which have a context uh, sensitive half time which is short are desirable uh, but this has a very poor predictor of recovery and plasma concentration may not be the same at what recovery is expected that is why why because here we are not assuming that the plasma concentration is the same as the effect site concentration that is in the brain again the concept of plasma concentration and effect site concentration i'll come to a bit later okay so now if you see the commonly used drugs etomidate propofol ketamine midazolam thiopentone and diazepam these were the most common anesthetic agents used now if you see propofol and ketamine almost have a similar uh, context sensitive half life Now, if we go to uh, uh, the remifentanil, which is an analgesic, almost goes like this. If you follow my arrow, and if we see the graph of fentanyl, it is somewhat somewhat like this. So, the fentanyl, as the infusion duration progresses, it uh, becomes so short acting to long acting, and dexmedetomidine is again somewhere between midazolam and ketamine, right? So, that is the context sensitive half life. That means that. as the duration increases at a fixed dose the context sensitive half time increases it is pretty stable for remifentanil for propofol and ketamine however with the dexmed also it is quite stable but all other drugs show an exponential increase so for anesthesia what are the drugs that we commonly use we use thiopentone propofol or midazolam for amnesia analgesics all kinds of opioids ketamine dexmedetomidine can be used and apart from that all these drugs can be used for uh, total intravenous anesthesia but you know as i showed you thiopentone has a very long half life midazolam again it has got a very short heart half life analgesics now we see if we see remifentanil let's refer to elfentanil to sifentanil to fentanil and over morphine because of the context sensitive half times and rapid elimination from the body ketamine and dexmedetomidine are the new drugs we know that there are problem with opioids again i'll be discussing it further and to enhance analgesia <clears throat> and the effect of other drugs we use lignocaine magnesium sulfate paracetamol and nsaids in addition to the uh, amnestic and analgesics and all of these can be combined with or without regional anesthesia and muscle relaxants so remember regional an analgesia and muscle relaxants are not a contradiction or you do not say that if i am using this i am not using tiga but yes in a uh, volatile anesthetics and nitrous oxide is unknown the moment you switch on those it no longer reveals so, tiga so we have different combinations uh, we have we can use uh, normally what we require is a hypnotic anesthetic and an analgesic to maintain anesthesia so the choices are propofol remi propofol elfentanil the commonly used terminology fentofol that is uh, propofol plus fentanyl pdf uh, propofol dexmedetomidine fentanyl or we can use mdf midazolam dexmedetomidine fentanyl um ketomet opioid free ketamine and midazolam ketofol propofol and ketamine ketodex ketamine plus dexmed kpd ketamine propofol dexmed and propofol plus dex but my advice would be whenever you are starting with tiva or tci keep it simple case it and you keep it simple so uh, what you do is you use you choose one hypnotic anesthetic which in most of the cases in 99% of the cases is going to be propofol and you choose an analgesic now remi is going to be available in india soon in another i think one or two months uh, themis is bringing it out we already have fentanyl we already have dexmed we already have ketamine so any of these can be used as an analgesic in um, infusion so these are the drugs which can be used for analgesic and again as i said earlier they can be combined with uh, muscle relaxants or regional analgesia the adjuncts they enhance analgesia and decrease uh, the requirement of other drugs so magnesium sulfate is given in the loading dose of 30 to 50 mg per kg maintenance is 5 to 10 mg per kg it is an analgesic and decreases the requirement of other drugs by 10 to 20% lignocaine now remember lignocaine is available in many um, forms and formulations even iv preparations are 
uh, lignocaine, which is a xylocard, which is preservative free. Then we have lignocaine, plain 2%. Then we have lignocaine with adrenaline, one in 40,000, one in 80,000, one in 1 lakh, one in 2 lakh. So which one to use? Remember, you have to use the IV preparation of lignocaine 2%, which is preservative free. Loading dose is 1.5 to 2 milligram per kg, per, per kg, and you infuse the same amount per hour. Now, it is an analgesic, decreases pain on, on injection, but you have to watch out for cardiac toxicity. Although it's an antiarrhythmic, but yes, with accumulation and in susceptible patients, it can itself cause arrhythmias. So, you have to keep a watch on that. Now, coming to the different phase of uh, TIVA. So, these are the drugs which we can use in combination, but as I said, uh, whenever you are starting, you may choose midazolam as a pre-medication. Um, then you can obviously propofol is there for amnesia and uh, hypnotic. And uh, you can choose one of the analgesic agents, whether it is an opioid or an opioid free, that is ketamine or dexmedetomidine as an infusion. Now, different ways of TIVA. Obviously, as I said earlier, we all have practiced TIVA one way or the other. Short procedure, we give policies specifically in uh, non-operating room anesthesia. How many have you given boluses of propofol or fentanyl or ketamine when the effect of spinal is wearing off uh, in an orthopedic sur uh, surgery or any other surgery or a cesarean and the surgeon says that I'll just take 10 more minutes or uh, the patient is just starting the peritoneum and the patient starts facing anything in pain. What do you do? You hold oxygen, you give a bit of propofol, you bit give a bit of ketamine. So what is that? That is nothing but TIVA. Uh, family planning cases, lap ligations, touch of thiopentone, touch of ketamine, touch of propofol, touch of fentanyl, all mix and match with oxygen or a patient joining spontaneous. That is TIVA. Ketamine in a child in, for CT or midazolam only for a CT, that is TIVA, right? So it can be used for anesthesia or sedation or monitored anesthesia care alone or as a supplement to regional anesthesia. The patient is anxious. How many times you have put uh, propofol in a drip and uh, infused it? So these are all kinds of total intravenous anesthesia only. So as I said, infusions can be given by saline bags, the crudest of all methods, serenity infusion pumps where we set a or follow a set rate and then we follow the target control infusion where we are targeting either the plasma concentration or the site concentration, which I'll come to it later. Now, these are your new uh, vaporizers, so to say. Uh, see the analogy. Um, most of you, I'm, I'm sure you must not have used ether, but uh, you must have read about ether. So what is open drop method? method. Keep on giving drop by drop till the patient is under, and as the patient is, uh, as the anesthesia is bearing off, you give further, uh, you add further drops. So that is your bolus technique or your saline bags. Patient is deep, you slow the drift rate. The moment the patient wakes, uh, is starting to wake up, you increase the rate. So that is your open drop method, right? Instead of inhalation, you're giving it IV. Syringe infusion valves. How many have used uh, Goldman vaporizer? One, two, three. A fixed rate. You don't know how much is going. That is your syringe infusion valve. You've started with 200 microgram per kg per minute. Then you come down to 150. Then you've come down to 100. But you don't know what is exactly the plasma concentration or the effect side concentration in the body. That is what you are giving. Okay. Now coming to TCI. TCI uh, relies on the mathematical formulas on experimental studies, which say when you enter the demographics of the patient, it will give you approximately, uh, uh, you, all you have to do is you have to set the target level and the pump will do the rest. It will give a bolus and maintenance rate on its own, judging by the time has elapsed and whatever concentration you have set, whether it is plasma site or if it's site, I'll be coming to that. These terminologies a bit later. So TCI pump is nothing but akin to a modern vaporizers wherein you keep on increasing and you know that MAC is going to correspond to your um, dial flow. Similarly, TCI, what you do is you set the plasma concentration and experimental studies have shown that uh, the Concentration shown on the TCI pumps is approximately 10 to 20 percent within range of your actual plasma concentration. Brain, unfortunately, we cannot measure uh, brain concentrations, but uh, we can assume and it still remains a mathematical model. So, what are the prerequisites for practicing TIVA? Nothing much. 
all the standard monitors, ASA monitors. Now, process EG and train of four are preferred if personal grants are used. Now, these are two monitors which are preferred even if you are using inhalation anesthesia. These are not mandatory, but yes, process EG becomes sort of a semi-mandatory thing whenever you're using TIVA. Tough if you're using muscle relaxants. In fact, best they say that you should use a uh, train of four even if you're using or giving a single dose of any muscle relaxants, be it, uh, be it uh, uh, depolarizing or non depolarizing You require a dedicated functioning IV line, three ways, PMO lines with lure lock, that is important, 50 ml syringes, syringe infusion pumps or a TCI pump, and a separate 10 ml loaded syringe of propofol just for emergencies, just in case you require to boost up the depth a bit. Now, what is a TCI or a target control infusion? That is nothing but a con controlled infusion, which is algorithm based. It achieves a user defined drug concentration either in the plasma or at the effect site, that is your drain. So it is similar to achieving a MAC by setting a, uh, uh, the uh, vaporizer percentage, right? Now, there are three models which have been used. One is a compartmental model, which is most commonly used, a physiological model, and a hybrid model uh, for the distribution of the drugs, which have been used to derive these algorithms. Now, this is the most common model which is used, which is the uh, compartment. So, when you give a bolus of the drug, it goes through the central compartment V1, right? Then it goes through the rapidly equilibrating compartment V2. Now, these are the constants. K12 is elimination constant from central compartment 1 to 2. And obviously, over a period of time, there will be movement of the drug from com compartment 2 to compartment 1, which is given by K21. Then we have the slowly equilibrating, uh, equilibrating apartments such as the fat and the subcutaneous K13 and K31. And finally, it is the effect site, which is the K0, right? Effect site pressure. And ultimately, some of the drug is lost to elimination or metabolism. So these are the three compartments. Ultimately, when we say plasma concentration, we are targeting the central compartment. When we say effect site concentration, we are targeting the brain. So the algorithm tells that this is the most likely concentration for this agent in white height. If we set it as a plasma concentration of three, the pump will decide that for this particular age, height, weight, I have to give a propofol at this much rate so as to achieve a plasma concentration of three. Similarly, when we set an effect site concentration of three, that means that the pump will decide on its own on the basis of patient demographics that I'll have to infuse this much amount of drug to achieve a concentration of three microgram per ml at the level of the brain, keeping into account all these constants and the elimination. That is the uh, basis of compartment model. And most of our uh, models are compartment. So there's a physiological model. Again, it is used only for research purposes. Um, it requires unknown parameters. It adjusts to pathological shape. Now remember, compartment model is for a healthy patient. Uh, if there is also constriction, patient is on ninotropes or some other pathologies. Now the compartment model does not take that into account. And also the drug of taking different issues, physiological model. We have broadly divided into three compartments, but we know that there are more than three compartments and each tissue has a different uptake and elimination constant. So physiological is obviously more physiological, but then uh, work needs to be done with that. So again, the, com com uh, the hybrid model, and it is the compartment model adjusted to physiological parameters or a combination of the other two models. The most commonly, or the first model which came up was the plasma concentration, that is the MARSH model. That means that what they did was that they gave protocol, bolus of protocol, and they measured plasma concentrations. And then they uh, derived an algorithm based on the age, sex, and total body weight of the patient. Lean body weight was calculated by the machine, and age is entered only to ensure that since it is in, uh, the study was done in adults, the age is not used for calculation of the rate that is infused. It is just to ensure that you do not use this model in 
children or uh, in less than six years of age. So what you do is that what we choose is that what is the plasma concentration that we want to achieve and the computer or the chip or the software will calculate the rate of administration. So all you have to do is that I want to achieve a certain plasma concentration level after feeding in this, the rest is done by the pump only. You don't have to do anything. Now we all know that uh, there is a lag between the plasma concentration and clinical response. Normally we say that it is one arm brain circulation, but actually it is not so true. So the lag is much more. Uh, there is a temporal uh, relationship between plasma concentration and clinical response, as I showed in that figure. That is given by Ke0 or Keo. So physical properties and mutants of providing alter Keo. In the effect side decrement time, that means it can also be used when we are using effect side equilibrium model. It can also tell you how much time is left that, okay, uh, right now my effect side concentration is say 4 microgram per ml of propofol. Now, if I stop my pump at this time, how much time will it take for the patient to wake up? So this can also be calculated by the machine and the computer. All we do is we enter the age, height, weight, and sex of the patient. So um, lean body weight is calculated by these uh, formulae, and it requires a smaller volume of distribution. The KEO, K1, 2, 2, 1, all these are, and the volume uh, volume calculated for the compartment are slightly different from the March. Remember, March is harsh, Schneider is more um, physiological and gives a better predicted uh, results. Why? because this is targeting the concentrations in the brain, although uh, derived exclusively from studies rather than the plasma concentrations, because we cannot measure the concentrations in the brain. Okay, now this is the newest model, effect site equilibrium, likely to change the practice of TY and TCI. It's a universal model. Now, the problem with Schneider is that, again, this is for adults, it cannot be used in children. Uh, it is not very useful in obese. In fact, if uh, the BMI crosses 35, then it says that this model cannot be used. And we all know that obesity, uh, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics are totally different. So this model cannot be used. Now, LFL is one model which is universal. All you have to do is you have to enter age, weight, height, and sex. Um, free fat mass is used, which is based on, again, calculations. It can be used from 27 weeks post gestation till 88 years. So 600 gram to 200 kg weight. It gives an initial large bolus, although over a period of time, much less proper requirement than the other two models. And the main thing was that it is more sort of physiological, you can say, because uh, when this model was uh, developed, it took into account the best values as well. So now if you see this, I hope you are able to see this. Uh, oops, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So this is the target concentration plasma. That means we start at six refreshing. Okay. Then it goes down in season pedia. So it is. It has already just, uh, decreased. Then you again increase. It goes up. Then you stop again. So that is how the graph progresses. Now this is interesting. This is a Schneider model. Right now, this is the effect side. So, what it does is that just follow the black line to achieve a brain concentration of six. What it does is it gives a large bolus into the plasma that is overshoot of plasma concentration so that the patient is induced fast. As we see here, at six, the patient is not likely going to be sedated or induced. And is unlikely to be induced, or the basis is unlikely to be um, less than 60. So, to achieve the concentration in the brain, it gives a large bolus. And then, whenever the concentration is increased, it gives a plasma overshoot or a large bolus so that the depth is quickly achieved. If you see that, uh, there are obviously marsh effect site and marsh plasma. But conventionally, Marsh is plasma targeted and Schneider is effect site targeted, although you have the options in both. And uh, over a period of time, that is the volume required. So if you see Marsh plasma is much more, Schneider effect site is much lesser. That is the volume of protocol required over a 25 minute period. 
Now, these are the different models that I was talking about. It is not only for propofol, but a whole lot of drugs. So we have the specific uh, Marsh model from uh, uh, 2 to 17 years. We have Schneider 26 to 81, Peach Fuser 2 to 13, uh, then Kataria from 3 to 11. And uh, again, we have the so we have the cotinous models for uh, we have the cotinous models for obese patients that is from 21 to 53. Again, we have the weight ranges of these patients, right? And we have the height ranges also. And these were the number of subjects which they have used. And this is the level model. Although this is 0 0.68 to 160, now there was an level two which has gone up to. Uh, 62, uh, 600 grams to 200 kg. For remifentanil, we have the Minto model and the Level model, and Kim Ovara again for the obese. Sufentanil, we have the Geps model, Dexmedetrimidine, we have the Anywood, and the Mods model. Fentanyl, again, we have the Dex model. So we have different models for all these drugs. Even ketamine, we have a model, right? So we have models for all these drugs, and these can be used. In the, uh, in the pump, and uh, we have pumps which have all the models incorporated, and these can be used, right? Now, if you see this, uh, this is a simulated graph. I've used Marsh model to a plasma concentration of three. If you see, the effect site concentration takes around 12 minutes to reach, where the plasma concentration is achieved almost simultaneously. Next one is the level. Now, if you see, it takes around three to four minutes to achieve the, rather, sorry, it takes around two minutes to achieve a effect site concentration of three, but look at the plasma overshoot. Here, the plasma was three. Here, it has to gone up to 16.6 .6 micrograms per ml, whereas in the Schneider, it'll take around um, somewhere around 2.5 to three minutes, give a bolus of uh, maximum plasma concentration of uh, six micrograms per ml to achieve, uh, not six, it will be much uh, more, it'll, it is around 12, uh, to achieve the plasma concentration of, uh, effect site concentration of uh, three. So that is how the models vary, but again, we have to see the clinical site. Now, how do we go in with TCI? It's very simple, actually, all you require is, you don't uh, take the BP in the same arm as the IV, you obviously take a larger vein, the site, of the intravenous cannula should be visible. There should not be any leakage. You have to check for kinks. You avoid high concentration at low speed. So it is another good option to keep only one, one strength of uh, propofol in the OT. So we know that we have 2% propofol and 1% propofol. So it is always better to have only one particular concentration of propofol um, in the OT, either 1% or 2%, 2% is obviously better. Um, you set a target of uh, 4 microgram per ml of effect site as a site is always better uh, to for induction and then you can increase or decrease depending on the base and hemodynamics and maintenance is usually at around what I have seen is uh, you can maintain between 2.5 to 3.5 microgram per ml is a maintenance source required in, in its subject. So what you do? Monitor best. If the base is more than 45, first is you increase propofol. If base remains high, you increase the animals. Okay. If base is less than 40, first is you decrease propofol. If not, you decrease your remifant, uh, your analgesic. If the base remains high even after increasing your uh, propofol and increasing your ketamine, look at the BP. More than 25% increase, more than 20% increase in BP. Again, you first increase the analgesia, then you increase your um, propofol. And if there is decrease, you first decrease analgesia, then you decrease your propofol. If there is movement, but everything is just fine, first you increase uh, your uh, this thing. And if not, movement is not there, you obviously do there. But if you feel that you've already given adequate analgesia, adequate sedation, then if the patient moves, then most likely you will require a muscle relaxant or it is time to um, give a top. So these are the common uh, scenarios that you feel that uh, it can be used from ASA 1 to 4. 
no contraindications even in uh, pregnant even in children anywhere even cardiac anesthesia people are now using uh, tiva and tci a level model is being used in cardiac also i know so you start at 4 4 becomes a bit little, little too much for in population i would rather start at 3 3.5 Uh, a better option is you start at two, gradually increase it. Remember, it's a slow process. It's much like ether. You keep on increasing slowly and see the effect, and then move forward rather than giving a bolus and causing a hemodynamic cla- uh, collapse. So, for normal AS in one and two, you can probably start at three, three point five. For ninety kg and above, obviously UVs, uh, you are entering in the total body weight. So you start at a lower dose. Dose. Same with the uh, elderly patient and AS three patients that you start at a lower dose and then gradually increase your uh, concentration. So slow induction. That is the no. That was uh, this is for induction and this is for maintenance. So maintenance range is two to six microvolts. It's a very wide range, obviously, now because you are giving analgesics also. Each analgesic will behave differently, so you'll have to have. A range, right? So uh, remifentanil is usually diluted. Uh, it is a very potent drug. These are the monitors, uh, the depth of anesthesia monitors that we commonly use. Uh, that is the PIS. It is an algorithm based on power spectral analysis, scaled from zero to hundred. It can be single or double channel. Um, we say that uh, if the base is between forty to sixty, recall is rare and the depth is adequate. It has a small, it has a very slow response rate. So all, even though you have given a bolus of propofol, or if you have increased your uh, propofol uh, rate, then uh, the rise may not be uh, immediate. And obviously, it is affected by neurological deficit, hypoxia, hypo or hypercarbia. Ketamine and nitrous oxide are uh, notorious to give a uh, falsely elevated value. Uh, again, surgical stimulus and pain not very reliable. Movement of the patient. If the EMG is more than thirty uh, or forty, uh, the values are uh, not reliable. And obviously, cautery is going to play the culprit. QCON consists of two uh, values. One is QNOX and one is QCON. That is why it, the monitor is called QNOX. So QCON is consciousness, and noxious is signals in patients moving in response to nail bed pressure. So it uses the fuzzy algorithm again. Scale is zero to ninety-nine, and the range is the same. But they say that it has a rapid response time. Now, so if you have hypertension, tachycardia, movement, or autonomic response, suppose you don't have a PEG and you want to give a TVTCI clinically. So if you have any of these, that means there is like value. If you have this, you see the base value. It is high. Then You first increase your hypnotics, and then just accept it. I said earlier, if it is in the right range, do nothing. If it is low, you decrease. Stable hemodynamics, no movement, no response, adequate. If this is high, first is hypnotic, then analgesic. Again, if it is okay, do nothing. And if it is low, come on, decrease. Hemodynamical instability, hypertension, arrhythmia. That means that the patient is deep. If the value remains high, that means that there is some surgical cause. Um, you might have to give uh, blood pressure support, and if it is a uh, desired range, again you have to look at the cause. You have to give vasopressors, and if the uh, base is low and you are having hemodynamic instability, hypotension, arrhythmias, that means you need to come down. You are probably giving too much of hypnotic time. Now. An advanced thing in this is the AI. So the machines are taking over. You don't have to do anything. Everything is done by the computer. So what it does is you have syringe and hidden arms containing different anesthetic drugs. This is a closed loop. There's an anesthetic depth monitor, white design monitor. So all the information goes to the uh, computer, and based on these inputs, the computer will regulate your infusion. Those are just CT and CE uh, concentration. How? So first, what it does is checks the uh, base using uh, SQI if it is valid. So you set a target that this is the target I want with base. Uh, if, uh, uh, this is the base target that I want. So if the base is outside, it will increase the propofol. 
right? If the base is normal, it will see the response, right? And again, it will see the hemodynamic parameters as well. Now, what they're coming up with is CLADS2. So there, what they're using is they're incorporating uh, the train of on four monitor also. The moment the train of four rises above a certain level, a bolus of neuromuscular uh, blocker will go in, the pop will go in. So it is sort of an automated anesthesia. All you have to do is set the, set the values, sit back, relax, have a pop of coffee, WhatsApp, chat, and um, read the newspaper. But it is not so. We all know in anesthesia, this is what it seems to other people, but uh, it is not so. So, and remember the syringes always keep another syringe ready and uh, make sure that there are no leaks, no disconnection. Make sure that the propofol is going into the veins. So, how I do it? First, I'll come to TIVA with opioid. This is without uh, the TCI pump, although TCI pump is almost uh, the same. But since uh, TCI pump is not easily available, I'll just tell you uh, with uh, without the TCI pump, a simple syringe infusion pumps. As I said it uh, earlier also, yes, keep it simple, not too many drugs to begin with. Um, what I do is I keep it pure. One uh, hypnotic, that is propofol, which is common, and one analgesic in opioid or ketamine or dexmate. Never mix too many, too many drugs. I mean, I mean, I don't know how many have tried biscuit and vodka together, but it leaves a very bad hangover the next day. So don't mix your drugs initially, at least when you are um, good enough and we are uh, well qualified, or you're a good bartender, or you have a good part bartender with you. Only then mix your uh, drug, and obviously then we all know the effect is pretty good. So when you are starting it out. Please do not mix too many drugs. Just keep one hypnotic one. Routine checkup and preparation. Process CG is always preferred. You pre-medicate with midazolam, 0 0.03 milligram per kg. You load with tristoid. 500 ml is not going to do much. Regional anesthesia, if you feel you want to give a block, please go ahead. I usually give an opioid uh, or morphine, as I would do, as a bolus. Propofol 2 milligram per kg, oxygen and layer. And what I do is, these are the routine things I do, but instead of start, uh, starting an inhalation agent, I start the propofol. So it's basically the same anesthesia practice that you've been doing, except that instead of inhalation, you maintain the depth of anesthesia with propofol. So you start your propofol infusion at 200 microgram per kg per minute, or if it is too difficult to remember, start at 10 milligram per, uh, 10 milligram per kg. For the first 10 minutes, decrease it to 8 milligram per kg for the next one to two hours, and further decrease it to 6 milligram per kg thereafter. If you have PEG, you can tweak it around to maintain this amount. 50, 40 to 60 is our thing. Simple. So, all you have done is that instead of inhalation, you have just used protocol to maintain your depth of anesthesia. Sorry, I'm getting a call. Hello. So, opioid may be simply supplemented as a bolus, as you would do for any other uh, uh, anesthetic. So, fentanyl 1 microgram per kg per hour, 2 morphine 0.1 milligram per kg every 4 hours, as you would do with the inhalational anesthesia. Or you can use the fentanyl you know, 0.5 to 1 microgram per kg per hour. Now, stop all infusions 15 minutes prior to anticipated surgical time. PCM inserts to round off your multipolar analgesia. And if you stop the uh, infusions and patient is coming out, surgeon is taking, taking agonizingly long time to um, close their abdomen or take sutures, or um, there's a trainee there who's uh, learning how to suture, you can always use 1 to 2 ml of propofol bolus as well, even in between. So that is why the 10 ml ceiling of uh, loaded propofol. Now coming to period three. Now, we know that opioids are not all that good. They have their own problems, increased post of pretty and now they are vomiting, sedation, uh, retention of urine, then we have um, respiratory depression. Uh, opioids are now being uh, questioned for cancer surgeries, for inflammatory response, and many other things. So what I do is, I, the, I instead of an opioid, pre-medication is the same, midazolam, but I add glycogen because I'm using ketamine, causes salivation, so glyco, 
600 million slight risk of bradycardia, so like the pre-medication. And make as 2 per ml. Uh, ketamine or dexamine, 2 per ml. I start a loading dose of 1 per kg over 10 minutes, right? So it is 1 milligram or 1 microgram per kg over 10 minutes. Propofol as earlier, infusion of NLJ6, right? Keep it at 0 0.5 um, milligram or microgram per kg per hour. I usually do not touch the NLJ6 dose. Usually I do not require, but if I'm, uh, that is usually with a uh, block that is uh, that I'm giving. Excuse me, I think I'm getting a call from the, this one please. Hello. Uh, I thought it was from the, uh, Right. Uh, right. So uh, that is how I use. I do not just do not usually touch the energetic dose. And depth is either increased or decreased uh, specifically by protocol infusion. Now, if in spite of going to the maximum CP or CE, I feel that the hemodynamics are going haywire. I increase the uh, analgesic dose a bit, but usually that is not required. And obviously a bolus can be given and you give multiple analgesia. A regional, if you're given regional 0.5 uh, milligram or 0.5 microgram per kg per hour, usually more than sufficient. So coming to troubleshooting, if you have trouble, um, we have hypertension, okay, fluids, or mefentramine. Now, the most common misconception is that why give mefentramine? That is uh, reserved for spinal cases. No. See, what is the problem? Why? What is the cause of hypertension? In spinal, it is vasodilatation. Similarly, with propofol, it is vasodilatation. So, you give fluids, you give mefentramine. Do not decrease propofol if depth is adequate. And that is one of the most commonest mistakes that we make with inhalation analysis also. The moment the BP drops, a first instinct is to decrease, uh, decrease the inhalation concentration. So what are we doing? We are not tackling vasodilatation. What we are doing is maybe we are making the patient awake. We are increasing his sympathetic activity by making the patient awake. So please do not do that. Find out the cause, what is causing hypertension. And usually it's vasodilatation, easily corrected by fluids of propensity. If there is hypertension, you increase the depth, increase the analgesia, and do not other causes. One of the most common causes is that you have not categorized the patient and blood test full. Patient wants to avoid. Depth is low, the polar of propofol increase uh, increase the rate of infusion. If the depth is too high, you can stop the propofol infusion or you can decrease the rate. Um, now, at the end of the surgery, if the patient is uh, breathing spontaneously, tolerating the tube, but it's simply too deep. Most likely, it is not particular. If you have used opioid and you have to get an alaxone and the patient will take up like this. Now, we know that neuromuscular blocks can be reversed by neostigmine, sugamadex, and others. Can we actually reverse TIVA? Can we reverse uh, propofol? Opioids, yes, we can uh, use nelaxone. Now, this was an interesting case. I had uh, used dexmeterumidine and propofol on a young male coming for redo uh, TMD and chylosis. And um, he had had a previous surgery in inhalation uh, with the almost limited mouth opening. So I started my, I pre-medicated him, anesthetized, uh, anesthetized the airway, started on dexmed infusion. Uh, the tube went in smoothly, started my propofol, gave bilateral mandibular nerve block, and the surgery proceeded. The surgeon had said it will take me around three hours, they took six hours. At the, at the end of the surgery, Patient is absolutely fine, breathing spontaneously. No muscle relaxers are used for the entire surgery. And um, patient is absolutely fine. There's no hypothermia, nothing. You don't know what it is, but this is 60. It was in a real intubation. We, patient is breathing spontaneously with a good time volume, but not as fine at all, not even to pain. So what to do? So the best, best is around 60, not anything at all. No response to stimulus. So can we reverse this river? I'm not given any muscle relaxant, I'm not given any inhalation, um, continued for one hour, didn't help. We waited for one hour for this patient. He simply wouldn't wake up. 
it has been described in the old timers will say even i have used it as a pg for inhalation and a cd if the patient has gone in too deep 5 ml in 20 ml saline over 10 minutes aminophile works wonder it can actually reverse fever we gave him that and within 5 minutes patient was awake and took out the tube another drug is caffeine 10 to 25 mg per kg but it can cause irritability travels in gastritis aminophile again you have to watch for hypertension and arrhythmia another drug is methylphenidate not that very easily available but yes aminophile um, is there in all emergency drug trials and can be used for emergency of fever but again these are anecdotal and case reports there is no uh, study that i can give you and uh, recommend its use or guidelines for its use some new drugs are coming which are heptiva hypnotic and narcotic so instead of two infusion pumps a single drug will do the trick something like ketamine or ether does it all which is a hypnotic narcotic and muscle relaxants so you don't even require muscle relaxants remi uh, remi mesalon uh, so it has already come into the market which is a narcotic plus benzodiazepine now these are the guidelines that now with uh, the sing tiva tc is the future so all anesthetists should be trained and competent in the delivery of tiva and uh, it it is a duty of the teaching institute to provide this training tci is always recommended over um, other techniques and uh, again the tci concentration should be treated as i said uh, for elderly and for as3 and patients vulnerable patients you have to go slow only one uh, particular percentage uh, the strength of uh, propofol should be available and lower lock connection is a must so that there is no accidental uh, this thing uh, disconnection and it should have a one way valve so there is no reflux of the other drug into the protocol into the back infusion pump should be program programmed only after the syringe containing the drug to be infused has been placed in the pump the reason being propofol it's easy so you should not do that you are setting up ketamine and you put a propofol syringe in that and you are setting up a you have set up the propofol syringe pump and you put a ketamine syringe doses will go here by so that is why please make sure that the label on the syringe the drug in the syringe is the same as the drug on the pump okay the catheter or the cannula from which the drug is going should be visible throughout again you have to be familiar with eeg it is almost uh, all always preferable and if you're using a neuromuscular blockering blocking agent peg is a must as well as Thirteen or four monitor. If you are administering tiva outside the operating room, as we most of the times do, the same standard of practice applies. So you do not come down on standards of practice if it is outside the operating room. So everything is difficult unless you practice. Once you practice, nothing is difficult. It might seem tough at times, but we have evolved. This was also anesthesia once upon a time. So the choice is yours. You choose to evolve, or you remain a caveman. With that, I end my talk. Thank you, and I'm extremely sorry for the disturbances and the technical glitches. I hope uh, I'll be pardoned for that. And thanks a lot. I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for such wonderful insight that you have shared upon the topic. Uh, indeed, it was a very wonderful topic shared by you and the insights shared by you. We hope that uh, all your um, uh, yeah. Hello. hello hello yeah yeah am i audible sir yeah you are thank you so much sir for such wonderful insights shared by you I'm upon the topic i'm sorry for the disturbances but uh, there were some technical glitches uh, and the phone calls i thought it was uh, your number you are in calling me for some technical glitches because of the earlier one so I'm sorry for the interruption. It's completely fine, sir. With technical things, we can't help. It's not in our okay. hands, so of course we can understand. Yeah. So moving on to the question and answer, sir, we have received few questions from the participants. I would okay. like to put it across to you. Okay. Uh, the first question is guidelines for the safe practice of TIVA. Yeah. So I've already covered that in the last two slides. I think uh, you should have gone through that. So that was covered in the last two slides. All right. So I'll request the viewer kindly go to the last two slides shared by sir. Or you will be these are available. The these are available on the CBA and uh, published freely. Be freely available. These are published in Anesthesia Journal. 
we'll move to the next question of another viewer of ours uh, the question is what are the target concentrations for tiva see concentrations for tiva will depend again on the uh, drug that you are using most commonly we use uh, uh, propofol now whether you are using plasma concentration uh, you are targeting the plasma or the effect site again the uh, range will depend on that but roughly you should remember that for adults it is 2 to 6 microgram per ml whether it's plasma or effect but then that has to be titrated to be effect all right so the range is quite wide okay thank you so much for answering this question we'll move to the next question and the last question for today's session and the question is what are the main components of a target controlled infusion tci system okay so it's nothing much all you require is an infusion pump it is tci is nothing but uh, an infusion pump with a tci program built into it you have a 50 or a 20 ml syringe usually we use a 50 ml syringe then we have the pmo lines with lure locks and one way valves three ways and I. that is all the setup that we require nothing much thank you so much sir, for answering all the questions that was the last question for today's session and at the outset i would also like to thank all the viewers who have joined our platform and who have stayed tuned with us throughout the session and i would also like to thank you sir for taking out your valuable time and for being here at our platform and uh, helping our viewers with your wonderful insights which is definitely going to help them in their uh, daily clinical practices so thank you so much sir thank you and i'm again sorry for the technical issues so it's completely fine sir we can't help it out it's completely fine so with all the last comments sir we can conclude the session here for today yeah please thank you thank you sir